Assalamu alaikum my friends youtube viewers let me explain to you some of the key points in a chapter chapter 7 uh, which is generally referred to as the rr for the heights let me just uh, make a few points about this chapter and um, if you have a chance to listen to it it's a uh, i've did publish it previously it's about 42 43 minutes and uh, all I can say is um, I gained extreme an extreme sense of spiritual upliftment just doing the translation and then afterwards listening back to it it really feel it really is very ele elevating to the soul and it also summarizes the the key points of the holy text, of the sacred text of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it does summarize some of the very key aspects of the deen and of the message. So please do listen to it um, when you're driving, when you're falling asleep at night, you know. But I want to just offer you a few um, clarifications and points around the translation. Now, the, the, the translation that I've uh, made of the text, of the original Arabic text, obviously let me first give a disclaimer and say that no translator, no person that tries to present or that tries to read or understand the divine word can do so in a 100% efficient way. And whatever we read, we read through the perspective of our own experience, our lives, our understanding. And that is what I've done, nothing more, nothing less. But I do feel that I have done, on a, uh, um, I've been sincere to the effort, I've been honest to the effort. So I've not tried to pursue any agenda, in fact, there <laughs> There are certain parts of the Quran where it's very difficult to translate because it doesn't, it, it really, you, you feel, wow, how do I translate this? Because I don't, this is not something I would have assumed, you know, this is something that is counterintuitive for me. But then you have to, you have to be faithful and honest to the wording. But now, let me tell you how this translation and there, there's quite a few more in the pipeline so i'm going to be producing them but as you might think there's a cost involved with uh, ai getting the ai sourcing the ai <laughs> because it doesn't come free my friends um and uh doing the production takes many 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 hours in fact the translation itself itself takes a number of hours and then to produce a rendering that is touching that for me is so important is the quran is the quran you see the the word quran means it's a qara a. it's a it's a it comes from the qara a. it is a rendering it is a recital and the way we've experienced the quran always is like you hear it through arabic so it's not your or it's not your you know your your first language even for arabs you know i'm arabs Honestly, I've been in the Arab world, and the Arabs do not, in everyday parlance, use the Quran or the Arabic of the Quran. They are able to, but even when they do use modern Arabic, some of the words have been, have been, you know, modernized. Some of the meanings of the words, and so when they hear the word tanaka, <laughs> you know, when they hear the word amana. They, they don't see it as being embracing because they use a different word for embrace. They use the word i'tanakal uh, Islam. He embraced Islam. So they've, they've, they've anglicized the very Arabic itself. And this is some of the discussions I had with some Muslim scholars many years ago when I was in Egypt. They will, they will lament it, the fact that Arabs have modernized the Arabic and so you get Various Arabics now. You get the Arabic, which is called the the the, the Luatul Fushada, the the the, the, um, the 
true Arabic or the, how can you say the Oxford Arabic? <laughs> you can use an equivalent term for English. As you get Oxford English, you get like, or Shakespeare. But then you also get the Quranic Arabic, which is really different from modern Arabic. You see, the, the Quran's Arabic is not, you can't do a one-by-one -one comparison with the Fusha, with the, with the modern Arabic that you find being spoken formally on television in the Arab world when there's formal news programs or in the newspapers, formal written Arabic. So formal Arabic, modern formal Arabic is very influenced, in fact, by, by secular Arabs and by even Christian Arabs. In fact, some of the major dictionaries, are modern dictionaries, are Christian scholars, Arabic scholars, that have translated or that have created those dictionaries, some of the most prominent dictionaries. And um, Arabic is, often modern Arabic is uh, driven by countries like Syria, Lebanon. You see, those are the countries that are driving the Arabic um, dictionaries, especially Lebanon. I'm thinking of the Ilias Dictionary. So if you're an Arabic expert, please, you, you're welcome to comment on what I'm saying here. Please feel free. Put your comment in. Am I eating the spot? Am I off the mark? But definitely, in my opinion, having listened to the um, Fusha or the modern formal Arabic on television, and um, I'm fairly capable, you know, in understanding modern uh, formal Arabic. Um, I find it very, very, very different from the Quranic Arabic. So I don't see it as the same as the Quranic Arabic. And and so what you're going to find is that the words, the meanings will be slightly, there will be slight shifts in the understanding of the meaning. I always make this example to people who speak English and I say, look, if I tell you um, the word gay, uh, what does it mean in modern parlance? We, we all know what it means, right? We all know what it means. I don't have to go through it. But yet in my own lifetime, when I was a young boy, we, used, we, we always used that word to mean something completely different. You know, it, it meant a, a happy, jovial, uh, pleasurable, um, fun-loving person. You know, happy and gay. So we used to use those two words together. And that's just to give you an indication of how words in Arabic can take on different meanings. And so, now that is the one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is that Muslims also have a few generations of scholarship which they have frozen in place, like the years after the Prophet And, you know, the frozen years, the frozen scholarship, which they tie around the Quran, the scholarship which they which they place on the holy text of the Quran, is not even the scholarship of the Prophet It's not the scholarship of the Khulafa Rashidin. It's not the scholarship of even the Tabi'een. It is the scholarship of the people who came 200 years after the original generations. And so people will often tell you that you should go and respect the views and the opinions of those people who wrote Bukhari, Muslim, who wrote the original Tafasir or the exegesis, like Tabari and, um, you know, whatever other Qurtubi and Ibn Kathir and uh, Tafsir Jalalain and, um, you know, all these great scholars you should read the Quran via their opinions. But nowhere did the Prophet make any point that you Muslims should be understanding this Quran via the scholarship of people 200 years after him. So I'm not, I'm not beholden to those scholars in this translation. I don't use those. I, I, I listen to them, I look at them, I have the uh, Kashaf of, uh, of Zamakhshari, which is for me a excellent, uh, um, tra not translation, but in a reading of or, or understanding a perspective on the understanding of the Quran and the Kashaf by Zamakhshari. I love it because it is, he, he approached it from a linguistic and uh, from a rationalist perspective. In fact, Zamakhshari called himself 
Zamakh al Murtaz, a Sheikh al Murtazili. So he was the rationalist Sheikh. And that is his, the name he gave himself. So I don't have a. I read Zamakh Shari, but I also read, you know, because all the English tafsirs, all the English translations are basically based on these old ancient scholarship opinions that um, are frozen in time. So let's come to this this reading then. So that is the pro proviso or the, the, the initial point that I'd like to make is that when I've done the translation, I've not paid homage to those. I've, I've read them, I've listened to them, but I haven't been governed by their reading of the text. What governs my reading of the text is the text itself. I've learned from people like Sam Gerens and from others that have produced beautiful modern translations, the uh, correctional officer, um, which I see as valid readings of the Quran, but also the product of a human mind. Right? The English is always the product of a human mind. And so I've, I've seen how they've done it. I've learned from them. I've seen how the traditionalist translations or readings or interpretations of the Quran are done. I've, I've, I've followed, I've taken what was, what was good from that. I, I always keep the kashaf of Zamakhshari handy and I always look at how this great Sheikh al-Murtazili, how he understands or reads the verses. Obviously not everything is in alignment with what he says. So the point is I'm try we're trying to find a logical coherent, rational meaning, because we believe that the Qur'an is meaningful, it is rational, it is coherent, and for that reason, our reading has to make sure that whatever we find is coherent. Now, let me, let me get to the point of this video. I don't want to make it too long. There's a few aspects in this translation that I need to mention. The first one is, let me just quickly come to the, to the bas, basmal, the the initial um, word of the Holy Quran. Let's let's quickly look at the introduction, the first words. I'm just going to mention that. In the important. name of the one true God, the primordial benefactor, who is kind. Okay, now you see that that to me is a is is fair, is a fairly big shift from what you are used, what you what you've been accustomed to. You see, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That is crucial because it comes up in almost all but one chapter in the Holy Quran. And it is crucial that we understand that sentence. It should not just be a mindless formula. You see, the, fo the formula that I've been read is the most gracious, most merciful. Why would, why would, God use such tautology. Why would that such a repeat of the same thing? The most gracious, most merciful. But if you really understand the meaning, then the Quran does refer to a name of God, which is Ar Rahman. You see, there's a verse in the Quran where Allah says, Call him by Ar Rahman or call him by as Allah. Whichever name you choose is fine. So Allah actually turns the name Ar Rahman in the Quran. It is regarded as a proper, as a proper noun, as a as a name, Ar Rahman. And so, technically speaking, what we are saying when we say Bismillah in Allah is not necessarily a proper noun. You see, Allah is not a proper noun necessarily. Allah means is a, is a is an illusion or is eliding two words, which is. God and the one. Right? So so it is it is it is bringing together two words, the one true God. Uh, actually that's four words. So it is those words pre brought together because Al means means the um, not always but sometimes it could just mean a capital <laughs> letter also to the word. It could the word Al is, there's two purposes to the word Al in the Quran. The one is to to make it uh, specific, so in other words, the, 
but the other purpose is also to make it a a a a a, 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 um, a uh, proper noun, right? So to just make it the month or an uh, a shahr or or an nahar, the river or, or river, as in an abstract broad term when you put the l there. So the what the l has two purposes, right? So when you say al ila. Because Ela, Ela, Eli is the original Aramaic uh, name for Allah, Eli, Eli. When Jesus, uh, the Bible quotes Jesus as saying, Eli, Eli, Elohi, Elahi, Lema Sabachthani. You know, those words are cited, I think, in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and it just means, my Lord, my Lord, Elohi, Elohi, Lema Sabachthani. So, it, it's an ancient um, Aramaic word Elah that is Al Elah and then becomes Allah. So the translation, as you can see, becomes the one true God, makes more sense. And then Ar Rahman is the proper noun there, Ar Rahman. And then why would you say, because in Arabic, if you say Ar Rahman or Rahim, you can use the Rahim as an adjective to the word Rahman. Right, so you can say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So, the you can either the Rahim or the kind or merciful or um, friendly. Or I would say all those words or you know the kind Ar Rahman, Ar Rahman, the kind. That is how I would read Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of the One True God whose name is Ar-Rahman, the kind. Can you see the meaning there? Now, uh, Sam Gerens, in his translation, he's, he's used the word, the, 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 I think he translates Ar-Rahman as most powerful or mighty. Or he is, he, it, he um, um, assumes a sort of a meaning of powerful or mighty in the word Rahman. But uh, really, the word Rahman clearly shows the core, the root letters uh, Ra, Ha, Mim, which is Rahima, which comes from the word mercy or being. He was kind, or he was. But the Rahman being on the scale of uh, 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 Rahama, right? Or, or Rahimanna. So it, 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 is, it, 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 it actually creates the the sense of kindness to its ultimate to its to its highest form right and um, if we if we think of it that the word rahman is a is a title that is unique to god almighty rahman then the sense we get is that it is the ultimate the one with ultimate kindness and that is why i've translated it as the primordial benefactor, the benefactor of benefactors, the primordial benefactor. So the translation goes then as in the name of God, as you've listened to it there. In the name of the one true God. In the name of the one true God, the primordial benefactor, who is kind. So that is where that comes from, just as an explanation. Another point I want to make, and I'm not going to exhaust all the points, all the comments of this chapter, is of course that I do translate the word jinn, ins and jinn, as ordinary and extraordinary men. Now, why did I do that? And I've got videos on this, right? So you can check back a year or two back some of the topics that I've covered on the channel. And I'm not denying that the word jinn um, in one sense, uh, may refer to um, non-human subjects, um, alien subjects, um, alternative life forms, non-matter-based life forms. I I can certainly leave room for that. And when you speak about the jinn as some sort of non-material life form, some um radiation or <laughs> energy based life form 
that's fine. I mean, uh, that 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 I'm open to those types of interpretations, even non-human life forms or trans Earth, you know, uh, extraterrestrial life. I mean, according to this chapter, the Adam is extraterrestrial. The the the, the, the original forefathers of humanity are extraterrestrial. They, they are not from this world. And uh, so we might as well then assume that there might be other life forms that are not from this world. In fact, there's one verse in the Quran, Allah says, It is who originated heavens and earth and scattered throughout the two of them through throughout these of all forms of life of all types of life forms so it is uh, conceivable that the word gene could mean a non-human life form so i'm not denying that but i'm i have to offer you one perspective i offer you another possible perspective and that is that it is human aliens that we are referring to when we speak about the jinn because even as you can see in the english language you can use the word alien to refer to a human um, exceptional person or extraordinary person or a non-human right the problem with reducing the meaning only to the non-human gene form is that we're not allowing ourselves the additional meaning of what an extraordinary human could be and in my videos where i discuss the gene and man i do again they also make mention that i'm not averse to the averse to the idea that the gene could be an extra terrestrial or a non-human life form but i am going to for my purposes make the assumption that it is a human um alien it is a, a human exceptional being and and uh, i will read the word jinn as somebody who is exceptional who is genius because that, that word jinn or genie is not an alien word in even in the latin language you know the word gene clearly appears in the word genius and uh, the word genius used to refer to a, a certain aspect of a person that is separate from you which is your genius right so it is and and so i read in this chapter and throughout my translation i am assuming or i am following the convention that the jinn would be extraordinary human beings human beings with exceptional power with exceptional skill with exceptional knowledge with exceptional intelligence and with exceptional power did i say that and in that way the Quran's verses around the jinn makes more sense because the Quran often speaks about many of the Muslims will be dis misled by the jinn. The many Muslims will accept the jinn as their gods. You see, and the Prophet met the jinn. Now, if you're saying that the jinn are these desert creatures, these uh, uh, fire demons, how many Muslims are taking fire demons as they gods? It doesn't happen. I mean, I have not seen it. So I'm going to have to assume that the Quran is using two different ways of thinking about the jinn. So that's the second point. And uh, you will see it coming up very early on. Um, Aleph, Layam, homage to Adam. They all paid homage except for Iblis. We relate to them that which is known, showing our calamity struck they could claim nothing else in mind. So many cities did we wipe out in the past. Catastrophe okay. from us struck them in the... Let's, let's, let's go on, let's take another topic. So Bismillah Rahman Rahim is the one, the jinn, that's the other one. And then let me speak to you about generally the, the, the shape and the tone of this 43 minutes recital. 
Uh, I think there's about five moves, uh, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see if I can recall them from memory. The first, the first movement <laughs> is uh, introduction, right? It just the, the the first verses just announce what this chapter will be like. So it it's a very terrifying opening few lines, and the few opening lines, at first of all, introduces as you as you heard just now, yeah. It actually starts out by sounding the warning. Still of night or during their afternoon rest. When our calamity struck, they could claim nothing else but we did indeed do wrong. We shall certainly hold accountable the recipients and the deliverers of this message. Then shall we relate to them that which is known, showing that we were never absent. Truth will be all that is weighed on the scale that day. Those whose scales weigh down heavily shall prosper. So as you can see, the first few lines of the chapter are very intense. It's, uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's there to, put, to, to make us sit up and pay attention because it does, it does sketch a terrifying future image of heaven and hell of uh, the two companies in dialogue of the company of the doomed company of hell the the, the regrets you know that's coming out from that side uh, the satisfaction the um, the comfort uh, fulfillment uh, the um, sense of accomplishment that comes from the people of heaven so it, it, it does set out the two companies initially Right draws a very clear picture of what is to come after this world, and it relates the future world back to the present world, and it relates, it, it tells us how to achieve the the good afterlife. The good afterlife is based on following truth and implementing it, uh, but discovering what is true, what is good, what is right, what is real. And basing our lives, our practice, our actions, our behavior on that which is true, right, and real. And that is the meaning of the word truth. True, right, real. And so what we then, how we dealt with what is true, what was right, and what was real in this world is really set up as the determinant of whether you will find the happy abode or the sad abode in the life hereafter. So that's the initial movement there. Then it moves to the creation story of Adam and Eve and how they fell from that position of um, innocence and how they allowed themselves to be um, distracted or uh, deluded or misguided by the devil. So that comes second in old story, right? Not in any way similar to the Bible story of telling how the rib of Eve and all that. That is absent in the Quran, my friends. There is one verse that might make you think it's, it's the rib, but it's not the rib. It's the nature of, 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 of Adam. So that is the second. So we first get introduced to the conflict between right and wrong and the abode of the year after. And then the initial sentence that spoke about the destruction of cities then, after speaking about the future of heaven and hell, and after speaking about the creation of Adam and Eve, and how Adam and Eve, the, their lives as it was changed by the act of deviation or going off the command of God, it, it then moves on to, um, okay, let me just quickly, um, we then are introduced to the story of previous ancient uh, cities and the destruction of those cities. So it, it starts out with Noah. It speaks about how Noah uh, ta uh, ta um, toiled to convince his people of worshipping only one God and not worshipping the rich men, the powerful men, the culture, the traditions, the uh, local customs, but to place the emphasis on the one transcendent, divine, um, cosmic creator. 
So that is really the message of, of all these messengers, right? Noah is the first in line, and then it goes on to the people of Ad, and then it goes on to Thamud, and then it goes on to the people of Shu'ib, Salih. Um, at some point it speaks about the people of Lot. Now there's a slight difference between each of them. You'll, you'll notice when you, re when you listen to it, is that each people was caught up in a different type of deviation. Every people was captured or deluded by a different way of being deluded. Like, for example, the people of uh, Salih, I believe, right? they were caught up. And it, the, the one common strand within all these stories is the powerful elite. So you have the messenger uh, deputized by God Almighty to render the message to go and tell them what is wrong with them or to expose the ills and the problems in their society. And the messenger is, without exception, confronted by the power elite within each of these societies. And so these very interesting stories are told and if you read it carefully, you'll see that every story has a slightly different form of corruption. Right. So in the case of Saleh, it is the corruption of economic exploitation. In the, ta in the story of Lut, it is the corruption of moral uh, decadence. Right. Um, in, the sto in, in some of the others, um, it is just basically being married or tried or, or, or in Shu'aib, I think it is the concepts, the ideas, the, the theories that they've developed. In, um, I think also in Shu'aib, it is about the camel, or is that Salih? It is about the camel. And so my reading there is because there's one sentence where the camel is referred to as the bellwether. So the camel, I would say in the, my reading of it, is that the camel represents nature. And so in their time, the problem was the assault on the environment, as we have today. And, and you know, as I read these verses, I get the impression that we are repeating every single vice, every single delusion that these previous people got strangled in, got caught in, we are caught in today. So we have these conceptual, like the ideas, like, um, you know, we are, we are caught in, in, in conceptual delusions. We are caught in a abuse of the environment today. We are caught in the abuse of the worship of the rich and exploitation by the rich. And we worship the rich and the powerful. So we today are almost visited by all these corruptions that these ancient nations were visited by. Right? So then the story proceeds and uh, continues then with an extended mentioning of the experience of Musa and Harun, Moses and Aaron, uh, and their encounters with the king of Egypt, with Pharaoh. Uh, the king of Egypt being a corrupt king, and this is the other important point I want to raise here in this. I think the first one is the Bismillah rahman rahim the second one is the Jinn, the third one is the, the, the reading that you will find there that I make of the of the yum. Now the word <laughs> Arabic word is yum. And uh, a lot of the scholars, the traditionalist scholars have translated the yum as the ocean, as the sea. But the dictionary does slant towards river. The river is the real meaning of the word yum. Right? Yum is a big body of water, but primarily a river. And you can go, go, go check the dictionaries yourself and you see it's primarily a river. Why are we using the translation of the word sea? It is because we are influenced by Israeliyat. We read the Quran through the perspective of biblical scholars, of to Torah scholars, of Talmud scholars, of uh, gospel scholars. Who all And the gospel scholars just copied the Jewish scholarship on this issue. And they, they see the parting of the sea as an event that took place where the Red Sea is really the sea. Do you know how wide is the Red Sea? My friends, the Red Sea is not a kilometer wide. 
I've flown over the Red Sea. The Red Sea is something like 80 kilometers wide. I think at some, at some point. I'm not sure the exact. But I've flown over the Red Sea. And it's not a quick walk across the Red Sea. Plus, if we look at the most contemporary powerful scholarship about Egypt and the history of the Israelites in Egypt. We have to link the Egyptian Israelites or the Semites of Egypt with the Hyksos people. H-Y-X-O-S. The Hyksos people are to be associated with the Semitic people. There are no hard evidence for what biblical or Torah scholars are claiming. They claim Hundreds of thousands of Israelites crossing the desert and crossing the Red Sea and going over into the land of Canaan. There's no relics, there's no remnants, there's no... They left behind for 50 years. There's nothing. There's nothing to back up the biblical story, my friends. But what we have to, that is plentiful support for, are the ancient Egyptian relics that speak about the Hyksos people who lived in the fertile Nile Delta area. Now, I was there. I saw Egypt. I saw the, was, I was in Alexandria. And the most fertile land on earth would be the Nile Delta area. I don't think there's more fertile land on this beautiful earth than the Nile Delta. And this chapter specifically refers to the Israelites as winning or scoring a victory and gaining access to the fertile lands of Egypt. Now, the land of Canaan is not fertile, my friends. Yes, it's fine. They do grow oranges there. They do grow olives. But it's essentially more desert than fertile. The most fertile place on earth is the Nile Delta. And so my reading of this story of Pharaoh and uh, Musa and Aaron is that I relate it through the, uh, my understanding of the Hyksos using modern scholarship my understanding that the Hyksos were confined to the side of the Nile, they were con they were prohibited from spreading beyond the one bank the, of the Nile, and that is what Pharaoh did. And I'm not even assuming that the Pharaoh of the Hyksos is the is uh, Ramses the second, right? So I'm I'm you. You have to read these things, you know. I would recommend that you actually make the effort and read some books on the topic and uh, make sure that you get s some of the views and understanding of, of contemporary scholarship around the Hyksos, around ancient Egypt. And um, so, for me, that was very important, that the Israelites are not crossing an ocean, they are crossing the wide and expansive, massive river, which is the Nile, which is the Nile. And believe me, that Nile is able to create a massive deluge. If that Nile comes down in flood, it will wipe out an entire army. It is capable of wiping out the army of Pharaoh. Don't picture a small river. Don't picture a small river. You have to picture a river that is bigger than... You have ever seen in your life. I've seen the Nile. And the Nile is not small. At places the Nile is as big as a huge lake. I have a big lake in front of me. And often I, I compare and I and I think the Nile would be as wide as this lake. Let me show you the lake in front of my eyes. And uh, I'm just going to shift the webcam and then you can see how big I picture the Nile. Take a look at this. This is where it starts and it runs for about a kilometer across to the other side. And it, it runs all the way from the river and then it enters the ocean at some point. So that is that is the lake that I see when I look out in front of me. Put to so death, basically, and their daughters we shall keep alive. After all, our power come back far the story exceeds then. theirs. Moses said to his people, "Find strength from God and in." So this is the encounter between Moses and Pharaoh, 
And interestingly, Pharaoh makes it a land issue. This is something that is never addressed by scholarship. Why is the Israelites of submission. dealing with a land issue? The powerful elite amongst Pharaoh's people called out, Are you just going to let Moses and his people go to our to... Lord and Sustainer? The wrath you impose is based on our acceptance of evidence from our Lord, evidence that appeared in front of us. Our Lord, instill in us steadfastness and take our souls in a state of submission. The powerful elite amongst Pharaoh's people called out, Are you just going to let Moses and his people go to stir up trouble in the land, having forsaken your gods? He replied, No, their sons we shall put to death, and their daughters we shall keep alive. After all, our power far exceeds theirs. Moses... You see, so once again... The, the Israelites as a slave nation doesn't come out here. It, it's more what comes out more is the Israelites as a as a suppressed nation, as a nation who is not allowed to grow or to flourish beyond a certain level. And uh, so it is really it they, they, they more emerge as a competition to the power of Pharaoh. you see, that is what I see here. I don't see the word, you know, enslaving. I see the word being suppressed by them, by Pharaoh. He said to his people, Find strength from God and endure. The land belongs to God, and he shall bequeath it to whomever he chooses from his servants. Now, a few verses back, and I just don't want to go through that detail again. A few verses back, Pharaoh says to the Israelites, your intention, or to Moses, I know what your aim is. Your aim is to unseat us, to get us out of this land, to kick us out from our land. Now, if you study the history of the Ixos, uh, and you and you study the history of Pharaoh, what you will find is that the Ixos, in fact, did replace the Egyptian pharaohs. For 200 years, the 15th and the 16th Egyptian dynasties were, in fact, the Ixos. They were the Semitic pharaohs. So the pharaoh, the Egyptian pharaohs, made way for the Semitic pharaohs, which I think ruled Egypt around the year 16, 1600 BC. So the Semit, so really the story of Israel and Pharaoh versus Pharaoh or Moses versus Pharaoh is a land issue. It is who controls the land and allowing people to access the land. And of course, this chapter makes a lot of sense when you see it as a land battle, not as a slavery or anti-slavery battle. Obviously, with a land battle, you get a lot of sideshows like, uh, you know, killing of the sons and trying to um, diminish or to suppress that nation. The final outcome shall favor the conscientious. The Israelites said, we are suffering oppression since before you came to us and ever since you approached us. Moses answered, It may just be that your Lord may destroy your enemy and make you inherit the land. Now that's a, that's a crucial point. You see, Moses does not speak, um, you know, sort of just willy-nilly. He is saying things that are prophetic, that it might just be. And the Arabic is kalu, uh, wait, I'm trying to get to. He might you make make you the inheritors of the land, and that is a prophetic word. And yeah, this does certainly does not agree with the biblical story that the Israelites left Egypt. No, they they left Egypt not as if they left Egypt, but they were able to flourish flourish through, throughout Egypt and to cross the boundaries into neighboring territory as well, which is the land of Canaan. But here, the, the, these verses must definitely, you must pay attention. The Israelites said, we are suffering oppression. Moses answered, it may just be that your Lord may destroy your enemy and make you inherit the land. And if you look at the story of the Ixos, where they actually toppled Pharaoh and then became the power of Egypt. The Semitic rulers of Egypt were the Hyksos. So that's another difference that I want you to pay attention to that I have in this uh, chapters. But it all hinges on that 
the crucial body of water is not the ocean. It is not the Red Sea. There was no Suez Canal. If if some of you innocent and ignorant picture the Suez Canal as the point of crossing, unfortunately the Suez Canal was only constructed, I think, in 1920s or 19, no, 1800s. So the Suez Canal wasn't there. There was a land. The, the, the continent of Asia and Africa were connected. There was just, you could walk from Asia to Africa. The Suez Canal is a very recent built um, canal. So Asia and Africa were connected, right? And the Red Sea is much too wide to just be walked across like that. And what do you find on the other side of the Red Sea? Desert. Here the Quran is speaking about you've inherited the most fertile lands. Let's look at the next verse where it speaks about this. Then he will lands. observe your behavior. For years the pestilence from them, after they reached the stipulated time, because they endured. That which Pharaoh and his people produced and erected, we annihilated. We allowed the Israelites to cross the water, where they encountered a nation obsessed with idols they held in their possession. Right, so there they the asked Moses, verses, Lord, essentially which says, favored the Israelites, so, come to pass, because they endured. So we bequeath to the people previously oppressed the Israelites, lands to the east and the west. Now the the lands to the Mashari kul ard wa magari biha, the eastern lands and the western lands, are obviously referring to the Nile, which is which neatly divides the fertile Egyptian soil into east and west. And so the, the, the Israelites, through the act of most, through the freedom, the liberation, the emancipation of the Israelites, were able to then spread beyond the, uh, 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 the, the, the east bank of the Nile, or the west bank of the Nile, wherever they were captured. I think they were captured on the east, on the west bank. And they could spread to the eastern side and they could cross the river and they could occupy that entire Nile Delta region and beyond and beyond, even into Canaan. Because there's no difference between Canaan. Canaan is not, there's no division between Canaan and Egypt at this point in history. You know, the, 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 you can walk across to Gaza from Egypt. So my friends, these are the points that I wanted to raise about the video. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, short summary. And uh, you will go and sit back and relax and listen to that previous video, the chapter 7 of the Quran, which is rendered in an AI voice, you know, toned and tuned by me, translated to just give you that perfect, ex beautiful experience listening to the Quran in, in English. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.